Hello, and welcome to my long-awaited tutorial on the puzzles known as Killer Sudokus. This video joins countless others on the subject, but having received so much praise for my other Sudoku tutorial, I just wanted my share of the pie. To all the people who gave me encouraging comments on the previous video, this tutorial is humbly dedicated. Right, first things first. I want to mention my own favourite Killer Sudoku site, which is called KillerSudokuOnline.com. This site has just about everything you'd want to enjoy Killer Sudoku, and, more importantly, they upload a fresh puzzle every day, ranging from easy to mind-bending, plus a few weekly puzzles that are even harder than that. Of course, I personally don't bother with anything less than the extreme level, but like everyone else, I started on easy and worked my way up. I should point out that I am not being paid to say that. I really do think this site is great, and it has given me many hours of enjoyment. In fact, Killer Sudoku Online don't even know I exist, and, to be quite honest, I sometimes wonder myself. Secondly, see that colour bar down at the bottom of the screen? It corresponds to the progress bar of the video, and each of those colours represents a different section. The idea is that if I'm being a bit long-winded, and you want to skip to a section later on, you can find it easily by dragging the progress marker. OK, introduction over. Let's get started on part one. What is a killer Sudoku? Answer. That is. Like a normal Sudoku, it's a 9 by 9 grid which, when filled incorrectly, will have the digits 1 to 9 occurring once and once only in each row, each column, and each of those 3 by 3 grids called nonets. However, unlike an ordinary Sudoku, in which some of the entries are given to you, the empty grid has these areas surrounded by dotted lines called cages. Each cage has a number in the top left hand corner which gives the total of all the digits in that cage. Look at the one in the top left hand corner for example. It's an L shaped cage of three cells with the number 16, what I refer to as 16 in 3. This means that the digits in those cells must add up to 16. Cages can be quite convoluted and can snake their way from one nonet to another. There is one restriction though, and that is that no cage can contain a repeating digit. For instance, this 14 in 3 could not contain two digit 5s as shown, even though the rules of normal Sudoku would allow it. Right, down to brass tacks. We start with the standard combinations, which you can use to fill in certain cages with numbers. Take 7 in 3 for instance. That's a cage of 3 cells totalling 7. This can only be one combination of digits, namely 1, 2 and 4, although we don't know which digit goes where. Similarly, 30 in 4 can only be done with the digits 6, 7, 8 and 9. These standard combinations are legion, far too many to name here, although I do know someone who has spent time calculating them all carefully and writing them down. And you know, to this day, he still can't work out why his wife left him. Some combinations aren't quite so specific. Consider 8 in 3. This can be either 1, 2 and 5, or 1, 3 and 4. Either way, it must contain a digit 1 and can't contain any digit greater than 5. Similarly, 15 and 2 can be either 6 and 9 or 7 and 8. And 28 and 4 must be either 4, 7, 8 and 9 or 5, 6, 8 and 9. This means it must contain both 8 and 9 and can't contain anything less than 4. In these cases, enter all the digits that are possible into the appropriate squares, then whittle them down later. In any case, you'll soon become familiar with various standard combinations and pick up more as you become more experienced. As soon as you spot a cage with the appropriate size and total, just enter the digits. The next section, covering the possibilities, really defies description and is best explained with a series of examples. This will illustrate the general principle which you can then apply when you recognise similar situations. Here we have 6 in 2 and 9 in 2, both in the same column. They are both standard combinations, which I fill in so. The 6 in 2 must be either 1 plus 5 or 2 plus 4. It must include either a 4 or a 5. The 9 in 2 must be either 1 plus 8, 2 plus 7, 3 plus 6 or 4 plus 5. You can probably see that the last of these combinations is now impossible, since either the 4 or the 5 has gone. We don't even need to know exactly how that 6 in 2 is made up. Either way, 
we can remove both 4 and 5 from the 9 in 2. Here's another example. 14 in 2 and 15 in 2. Again, both in a line. 14 in 2 is 6 plus 8 or 5 plus 9. 15 in 2 is 6 plus 9 or 7 plus 8. We don't know exactly how that 15 in 2 is composed, but it must contain either a 6 or an 8. The result is that the 14 in 2 cannot be 6 plus 8. It must be 5 plus 9 instead. Back to 15 in 2. We now know that this can't be 6 plus 9, as the 9 is spoken for, so it must be 7 plus 8. Removing one possibility has had a knock-on effect. One more example and then we can move on. Take a look at these two nonets. There are several standard combinations that we can fill in here, and we can do so like this. One of the possible values for the 7 in 2 is a 2 and a 5, but you notice that the 5 has already been used somewhere in the 29 in 4. This means that we can remove 2 plus 5 from that cage. Here's the clever part. The 7 in 2 must be either 1 plus 6 or 3 plus 4. Either way, it must include a 1 or a 3. But there is another cell in that nonet that must also contain a 1 or a 3. Either way, these cells must account for both the 1 and the 3. Those digits can't be anywhere else in that nonet, and we can fill in cells without those digits. We can go one step further with this example. There is only one combination for 9 in 3 that contains a 5, and that is 1 plus 3 plus 5. However, one of those digits must be used up by the cell in the top left-hand corner of that nonet. So that combination is impossible. We can remove the digit 5 from that cage. Now there are only two combinations possible for 9 and 3 that don't include a 5, namely 1 plus 2 plus 6 or 2 plus 3 plus 4. Both these combinations use up the digit 2 for that nonet and that row, so we can remove it from other cells like this. That was a complicated example, so you might want to rewind this video 40 seconds or so and review it bit by bit. As you gain experience at Killer Sudoku, you will find that similar situations will be easier to spot. Anyway, we'll cover one more topic and then call it a day. Because I get the feeling that I'm boring you. Not boring you, am I? Good. <coughs> You'll find you can't go far with Killer Sudoku before the number 45 and its multiples pop up. This is the total of all the digits from 1 to 9, so the contents of each row, each column, and each nonet adds up to 45. Similarly, the contents of two nonets will add up to 90, the contents of three columns add up to 135, and so on. Clearly, this means that the contents of the corner cell in this nonet must be 9. This principle is more useful in more complicated situations. Take a look at this. Those three cages add up to 53, which is 8 more than the 45 we would expect for that nonet. That means that these two cells must add up to 8, and are equivalent to a cage of 8 in 2, which is a standard combination. It's the same with larger segments of the puzzle. If you add up all those cages in the segment shown, it comes to 93. The total we expect for two columns is 90, so the cell which sticks out must contain 3. The same applies to dips, of course, but the totals of the cages will fall short of the multiple of 45 that you would expect. The cages completely contained within these two rows add up to 83, so the missing cell must contain 7. If the columns, rows on nets contain both bumps and dips, then the situation is more complicated. If the total of the cages is greater than the multiple of 45, then the total of the bumps outnumbers the total of the dips by that amount. Less than the multiple of 45 means the total of the dips outnumbers the total of the bumps by that amount. An example will make this clearer. The sum of the cages highlighted is 187. Four complete rows would add up to 180, so the two digits forming the bump must total 7 more than the single digit in the dip. This might not seem particularly useful, but you can use it to set limits. If we knew, for example, that the digit in the dip couldn't be less than 6, then the digits forming the bump couldn't come to a total of less than 13. 
immediately limiting both those cells to digits 4 or greater. Now consider the bottom three nonets of this puzzle. These can be separated off to give a dip of one cell and a bump of one cell. If you add all the cages in the area shown, you get 134, one less than the total you would expect for three nonets. This means that the cell in the dip is one bigger than the cell in the bump. The dip cannot contain one, the bump cannot contain nine. This rule is most useful when you can find long straight lines that separate cages down or across a puzzle. If there are too many bumps or dips, then it becomes impractical. So, there you are. As I said, there is much more that I could tell you about solving killer Sudoku puzzles, but, as they say in the theatre, always leave them wanting more. Besides, if I told you more, you wouldn't have an incentive to subscribe to my channel and watch my next Sudoku video, would you? I'm planning to dissect a particular killer Sudoku puzzle and perhaps answer a few viewers' questions. And if you don't subscribe, you might well miss it. Just saying, just saying. Also, I'd appreciate a comment below. By all means, make it rude and insulting. In fact, the ruder, the better. Please smash that like button, as they say, or better still, just click it once, gently. Because if you smash the like button, you'll never get it put back together again. And as always, if you didn't like the video, why not recommend it to someone you don't like? <laughs>